Friends, it's good to be with you guys at 11 o'clock this morning. Um, most of you know that my successor is a man named Jeff Manis, and he and Sabrina, his family, have all gotten moved here now. They are now local, so uh, we're thrilled that they're, they are here. They are in a period of sabbatical, which means that Jeff is not interacting with staff or board. Or, the whole idea is to be set apart, right? time with God, time to refuel. And so that's just to say to you that the online uh, contacts you guys have had have, have been life-giving to them. They are learning already to, to love the harbor. But anything beyond online, uh, this is sabbatical for them. So just know that. Uh, March 27th will be Jeff's first Sunday here. And so you'll get to begin to know him and Sabrina then, and then hopefully for decades to come as well. But between now and then, and then it's uh, sabbatical time for them. We just started this, spirit, this uh, series, What Life Are You Waiting For, last Sunday. And the whole mindset is we only get one life and only so many days, so many years, and only God knows how many days we'll have. But why would we squander any part of this one life? Why would we not yearn for all of the health that God intends spiritually and emotionally and physically and relationally and financially? Why, why would, we, would we not yearn for that? When we learn how to do it, why would we not embrace that and live this life to the fullest? What life are we waiting for other than this one life? So Weston started it off last Sunday about um, our spiritual life. And he said that the key to spiritual life is to be spiritually surrendered to Jesus. That's the core in a nutshell. If we are surrendered to him, if we follow his leading, his guiding, he will lead us into all things. And then Weston so accurately said that, that our spiritual life, it's the bedrock upon which everything else is built. It is the foundation, and if that's broken, it won't matter how good we get with emotions and our physical health and relationships and finances, all of that will collapse as well, unless we get this spiritual part right, spiritually surrendered. So, so I'm going to talk today about another part of health. I'm going to talk about emotional health, and I'm freshly appreciating the irony that me, an engineer, gets to talk about emotional health. And so if I can learn and grow in that area, then you can learn even more and far beyond as well. So I get to talk about that. And there's a term I'm going to use, and I'm, I use it very intentionally, but very carefully. I would not even tell you the term if I couldn't teach about it. I think God yearns for us to be emotionally optimistic. Now, if, if that's all I said, you could take that a thousand wrong ways, and it could be damaging. But I'll talk through why I think God wants us, longs for us to live out a life where we can be emotionally optimistic. So my early experience with emotions, um, I mean, I had times I can look back, I was happy, I was sad, I was excited, I was bored, I was content, I was discontent. But mostly I look back through my growing up years, and I say this with, with believing that my parents, I cannot imagine having better parents than them, but I don't remember us ever talking about emotions, ever. Ever. Maybe we did, and it slipped my childhood mind, but I don't recall ever talking. I even look back, and during my junior year of high school, I most definitely was deeply depressed the entire junior year. My older brother, who had been and is my best friend, went off to college. My first time in my life not to be living side by side with him. A couple of very important relationships unraveled that year. I mean, the whole year, it had to be obvious. Yeah, I was just emotionally just, just depressed. No one ever asked about it. So I grew up thinking that emotions just happen to us. And if they are pleasant, you, you enjoy them and ride them as long as they're there. If they become unpleasant, you suffer and hope they don't last long, but they just happen to us. They come and they go. So, and then I married Marie, which uh, has brought so many good things. But I married Marie. We are a year and a half into marriage. Um, she graduates from college in December, a year and a half in my company transfers us from Houston to Dallas on January 1st. We're in, Jan we're in Dallas on January 1st, and we left the, you know, the chaos of Houston traffic and everything. We're in Dallas, and I go out the very first morning, January 1st of that year. It was 1979, which was the worst ice storm they'd had in forever. It didn't dawn on me. I just got out, and there was no traffic. And I said, we're going to love this place. 
you know, there's nobody on the road. It, it, commuting would be easy and everything. And I came back to Marie and she said, did you hear the news? I said, no, no. They said, you know, everyone's still off the roads. It's, you know, it's so dangerous out there. And I thought, well, that explains why the roads were empty then. So we made this move. Marie moves away from her family, all of her best friends, all of her friends. She starts a brand new career in a difficult work situation. And she begins to get depressed. And I can see it, but just stuff happens. We have emotions, they come and go. We hope the uncomfortable ones don't last a long time. So she comes to me one day, sometime into it, and said, I would like to get some Christian counseling because I'm depressed. And I said, like, what do you hope to get out of it? I, I'm an engineer and uh, equations explain everything. And there's no equation for moving from depressed to happy. There's no equation. So why would you go? And, but I didn't say it too rudely. And so she persisted in the idea and I thought, what harm could it do other than cost a few hundred bucks? And, and so uh, she began to go. She took me a couple of times. And to my great surprise, it actually helped. It actually helped diminish the depression and get her back to a good place of health. So that was my first experience of recognizing that emotions could be bent. They could be changed. They could be transformed. Uh, some, some time passed. We both become followers of Jesus. More time passes. And I realized God is saying, someday you will leave your oil business job and you will become a pastor. Uh, which we had to process that, probably caused more, caused more depression than too, I imagine. So anyway, uh, as that time would seem to be getting closer, Marie said, you need to take a course on emotions because you don't know how to spell the word. And, and she'd been to a week-long, like a 40-hour class by Les Carter, a renowned guy in counseling world, the book's still out there, a 40-hour, like five-day, full-day uh, course. It was so good. She said, you need to go to that. And so um, I did with low hopes, expectations, and the learning began in earnest for me about emotions. I began to realize that emotions can be bent, they can be changed. God, in fact, intends to be working deeply in us to bring us to emotional health. So I want to give you some, just some core truths about emotions I've learned. And uh, take notes. If an engineer can learn this, then this is, you got to take notes. And engineers learn some stuff on emotions. First thing is this, before I give you a plan of how to live day by day. First thing is this, is emotions are a gift from God. He could have made us emotionless, couldn't he? He could have made us thinking beings, doing beings, emotionless beings, but he chose not to. Emotions are a gift from God. They allow us to experience life much more deeply, much more richly, much more intensely. And then secondly, Jesus, who is God the Son, who is just like God the Father, experienced the full spectrum of emotions. We're made in his image, and he experienced the full spectrum of emotions. I'll give you an example of some of them. He experienced deep sadness in Luke 19, 41 to 42. He's going into Jerusalem for the last time before his arrest and crucifixion. It says, as they came closer to Jerusalem and Jesus saw the city ahead, he began to weep. This is God the Son weeping how I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace, but now it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. He experienced deep sadness. He experienced compassion. Matthew 9, 36, Jesus is traveling about teaching crowds. Here it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He experienced intense anger. There's a scene described in Mark chapter three where it's a Sabbath and Jesus is gathered. There's some religious leaders there. There's a man there that has a withered hand, which would be difficult today, even more so in his time. It would define his work world, his economic world, his entire life. And Jesus is there and Jesus by now has healed a bunch of people. And he asked the religious leaders, this is Sabbath. Should a person do good on the Sabbath and heal someone? And they don't answer. The guy is sitting right there. Jesus can heal him, and they won't say, sure, they do not answer. It says, Jesus looked at them angrily, was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, and it was restored. He experienced deep anger at times. He experienced anguish, distress, and grief. The night he would be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 36 to 38. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John. He became anguished and distressed. 
He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. Deep anguish, distress, and grief. He experienced joy. In Luke 10, he has sent his apostles out to, to carry this good news. They've come back. They report back about how God has worked in it. It says at that point, Jesus was filled with joy of the Holy Spirit. I mean, Jesus experienced deep emotions, the full spectrum of deep emotions. He intends for us to as well. Okay, third key, just foundational truth. Emotions emerge from what we believe to be true. They don't come out of a vacuum. They may seem to. They emerge from what we believe to be true. I'll give you an example. Uh, many years back, Marie and I were hiking in Big Bend with Marie's brother, Eddie. Eddie's a soil scientist. He, he spends most of his life out in the woods and wilderness and everything. He, he lives outdoors, basically. We're, we're hiking along the Rio Grande River. It's on our left. There's the river bank. It's on our right. There's this narrow trail. Eddie's in front. Marie's second. I'm third. It's a beautiful day. We're soaking it all in. All of a sudden, Eddie quickly whirls and runs right at us. This narrow trail rushes by us and shouts, run! And if Eddie's scared, we're scared. And so Marie whips around. I whip around, and we run as fast, as hard as we can, a long ways. He finally stops. We stop. We're panting like, why did we run? He said, rattlesnake, rattlesnake. And sure enough, we went back up the trail because we had to see it. <laughs> and we had to get back to the car. We had to go back to the trail. And sure enough, there's this huge rattlesnake all coiled up. And so we took this long, long stick and we poked him and prodded him because we had to get him off the trail then. But, but there was this intense emotion of fear. And it came from this truth. There was this danger in the pathway. And it, it caused uh, adrenaline to course through our veins. There was this emotion that emerged, not out of a vacuum, out of something we believed to be true. Another example, Seabrook Trails is not too far from here. It's many miles in Seabrook of beautiful trails. I was there running four or five years ago for the first time there, maybe five or six years ago. And uh, I, I traveled the different trails I have there. There was one main trail that kind of cut off and came back in, and I, I ran it, and, and it was the most beautiful trail of all Seabrook. It's a place where the trees form a canopy over the entire trail. So in the summertime, there's full shade and the trees have dropped these pine needles on the trail. So the trail is very soft and it curves. It's just spectacular beauty. So I, I ran through that and thought, I will come back to this part every time. Second time I came back, I ran the trail and I noticed there was a snake that uh, was in front of me that slithered off, but it wasn't a rattlesnake. I grew up around rattlesnakes and I know them. It wasn't a rattlesnake and so it didn't faze me at all. And, and so great peace of mind. I, next time I ran, I made sure I ran that part. Maybe no snake the second time. Third time there was a snake. Fourth time there were two snakes. And, and I, you know, there are a bunch of non-poisonous snakes. I thought I need to find out what kind of non-poisonous snake it is. <laughs> and so I checked and it was, um, what's the term? Aggressive, highly poisonous water moccasins. That's what I've been found. I've been running the trail infested with water moccasins and they are aggressive and highly toxic. They can be deadly and everything. So my emotion, I'm sitting in my home desk, fear went all the way down my spine. I've been running up on these, wondering if they'd get out of the way in time for me. I've been running up on them. And so there was this fear that hit me in my own office. And then there was this sense of, Shame and stupidity. <laughs> How did I run past them all these times? Grace of God, I wasn't bitten by one of them. How did I do that? So you see, the emotions emerge from what we believe to be true. I believe they were non-poisonous, and, and I was at peace. I believed a lie. When I learned the truth, then I learned to be afraid of them. I have never run that segment of the trail. Again, I never will. If you're going down Seabrook Trails, you find a place where there's a full canopy, turn around, go back. Run, go back the other way. Our emotions emerge from what we believe to be true. Another example for you, maybe some of you are stock investors and suppose a good friend of yours recommends, highly recommends a stock that's moving and you get excited about it and you put a big chunk of your savings into that stock and you forget about it for a couple of days and you, you look a you, you, uh, second day and it has gone up 20%. And what are your emotions? That exhilaration, aren't they? How do you feel about your friend? Love him more than ever, don't you? But then you look back again and you think, man, 20%, and you realize you missed the negative side, and it went down 20%. Now, what are your emotions now? I mean, in the tank, what do you think you're friend now? You probably don't love him nearly as much now, do you, right? <laughs> so you see, emotions respond to what we believe is true. They don't come out of a vacuum. They don't even necessarily come out of truth. They come out of what you and I believe to be true. 
one more foundational thing. Uh, let me go back. So emotions are a gift from God. Jesus experienced the full spectrum of them. They emerged from what we believe to be true. Fourth final truth before I tell you how to walk this out is a healthy emotion is one responding to the whole truth. I found in a lot of my life, I've been responding in a time to simply part of the truth. I'm responding to truth, but simply part of the truth. I read about Jesus, Garden of Gethsemane, the deep anguish he was experiencing there. You couldn't find stronger words of emotion about him recognizing he was about to be arrested and beaten and experience the physical pain of crucifixion, but much more than that, the deeper pain of taking on himself all of the sin of all of mankind for all time, experiencing the full wrath of God against sin. He knew all that. That was the reason for the deep anguish and deep grief he was feeling. But there's another part of this that doesn't emerge in that passage in Matthew. It emerges in Hebrews 12 too. It's referring to that night when Jesus was experiencing that deepest grief. grief. It says in Hebrews 12 too, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Even that night, he knew the truth. He was responding fully to the truth, the, the anguish, what was about to happen. But he also knew that the cross wasn't the end. He knew there was a resurrection coming. He knew there was an ascension to heaven. He knew there would be untold millions, millions, hundreds of millions that would be in heaven because of this. He knew all that. So while he felt the fullness of the anguish, he responded to the entire truth. Can you feel, can you see the threat of optimism he even held there for the joy set before him? I mean, that's why he went forward. He didn't have to. He was responding to the whole truth, the crucifixion, the weight of sin, the resurrection, the freedom from, for all who would follow him from sin. He was responding to the whole thing. That's why I refer to the term emotionally optimistic, being emotionally optimistic. I mean, that's, that's how Jesus lived this planet. He fully experienced all of the truth not part of the truth, all of the truth at the very depths. So this is how it would look for you and I to live out those truths in practice. We, need, we, we must tend our emotions. We must tend to our emotions. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else. And to the writer of Proverbs, the heart would mean both the mind and the emotions He would say, you need to to tend all of this, guard all of this. It includes the emotions. Guard your emotions for it determines the course of your life. And and so um, to to do that, to tend to it, I think of how Marie and I tend to our backyard. Uh, Marie's been very specific about how she's uh, put plants in it and flowers in it and put a patio on it, has bird feeders around it, and we call it our little Garden of Eden. It is to us. And some of you, I'm sure, have much more beautiful backyards than it wouldn't be to you. It is to us. But we have to tend to it. We have to see when it needs to be watered, when it needs to be fertilized, when weeds need to be pulled from it, when it needs treatment from insects. There's a portion of the yard I know now, every August, fungus will begin to emerge. I have to treat it two or three times to get rid of it. We have to tend to our little Garden of Eden. In the same way, we have to tend to our emotions. Three questions can do that. First is this, what emotions am I feeling? Just pause long enough in the day and ask, what emotions am I feeling? And there'll be some days you don't, maybe you don't sense any emotions, and maybe that's pretty close, there's nothing moving in you. But most days you'll, you'll be able to sense something, and maybe there's a, even a, a collection of emotions that you feel. Maybe not just one, but, but the first thing is just simply to be aware of it. And now, if you're not in practice of this, I would recommend you just put it on your calendar, Wherever your calendar is, I'll put it on your calendar. Just, just pause at least once each day and just ask the question, honestly, like, what, what emotions am I feeling this day? Don't let them just run rampant because they will. What emotions am I feeling? Second is this, what perceived truth is behind those emotions? What perceived truth? You, you and I may be responding to truth or we may be responding to a lie. What perceived truth? What is it, what is it that is creating this emotion? What is the, the snake or what is it that's, that's going on, on in my world that is creating this emotion? And, and I've learned this. Um, sometimes I have not been able to put my finger on why the emotion is there. Even with a lot of thought, a lot of prayer, 
I've not been able to do that. There's a case many years back. Uh, so I've been a pastor for a while, and I recognized every Sunday I would teach. Then I would teach every Sunday just about. Every Sunday I would teach. I would go home, and I would feel like I just I blew it every time. And, and I would know I could look back, and I had prepared well. I'd done my very best. And sometimes I could see people were touched and moved. But there was this, there was this internal message just saying, you, just, you blew it. You just didn't do it. And, and I couldn't figure out what or why. I was uh, spending time with a counselor in that season. And out of some time with a counselor, something emerged that was buried so deep. It didn't even have words at the time. I, I found words around it, but I found where the message came from. When I was a six-year-old little boy... Went to first grade, first report cards came home. I made all A's, straight A's. I've told this story once before, you may know. Deep South Texas, most of my new friends uh, were Hispanic and they knew Spanish. A few of us knew English and they were teaching English. And I was really good. <laughs> I was a star because I grew up teaching English. My new friends learned it really fast. They got really good, but, but, but I, I brought home straight A's. And my parents being good parents applauded me and said, well done, well done. And they just meant, that's all they meant. But looking back, I began to take the message, I have to be exceptional. And the next report card, and the next, and the next, and the next. And, and I could do that for, through school, and I could do that as an engineer. But all of a sudden, as a pastor, I listen to exceptional messages. And, and I know, I go home, mine are not exceptional. They, they are my best, usually, my very best. They're not exceptional. And I began to look back and realize that was this underlying message. I couldn't even put words around, but it was moving my emotions. I, I would serve God with authenticity, with effort, giving my very best. And I'd spend the afternoon feeling rotten. And it all changed then. Because I would finish on a Sunday and the emotion would well up and I knew where it came from. And my practice ever since, and it'll be my practice this afternoon, before the day's done, I get along with God and say, how did I do? And you're the only one that knows. You're the only one that really knows. How did I do? Did I give you my best? How did I do? And it is, it is unraveled that consistent emotion of Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. But I needed someone to help me get there. I needed a, a great Christian counselor to help me get there. And that happens much more than you might imagine. Mark Paling is someone here who I have deep respect for. Listen to Mark Paling's story about this. And on the outside, I was uh, portraying that everything was okay uh, when it really wasn't. I, uh, I entered a period, um, a prolonged period actually, of, of real personal struggle. Um, I had a lot of trials that I was dealing with in my life. Um, my marriage was struggling, uh, it was in trouble. Um, I was trying to continue to lead my two boys well as they were growing up and growing out of the house. Uh, my job became very demanding uh, and stressful and um, it was stealing my joy. Um, it was challenging my faith and on the outside, I was uh, portraying that everything was okay. So after a period of time, uh, as this situation just continued uh, with no end in sight, um, I felt like God was uh, moving me to uh, just get with other people. And specifically, he drew me to get into a men's Bible study. So as I continued this walk, even while I was in the men's Bible study and being blessed uh, with spiritual community, um, I had a friend, um, someone who I trust, uh, someone who's wise and someone who would tell me what I, want, what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And uh, he said, you know, Mark, I think, I think you're carrying some extra emotional baggage. And um, I, I think you should talk to a Christian counselor about this. And I remember when he said that to me, uh, feeling sort of surprised. Uh, I, I hadn't really considered that before. And it wasn't because I felt like Christian counseling was a negative thing or a bad thing. Uh, certainly, I didn't feel like I was above it. Uh, but I didn't understand how it related to me. I, I didn't really have an understanding of how it could help me. I reached out to uh, a Christian counselor and um, had a couple of sessions. And, and as we progressed in that process, uh, the counselor really started to identify for, for me 
emotions that I was struggling with uh, that I, I wasn't even aware of. I think the first thing that, that, that God did was help me to see my situation for the way it was and help me to see the things that I could control and work in collaboration with Him for the things that I couldn't control. And uh, as we continued to progress, uh, my counselor also started to equip me with ways to, to deal with these emotions, right? I started to be equipped uh, in, in ways to uh, respond and process my emotions in a much healthier way um, that also aligned with my faith and also aligned with God's design for me. And um, as, I, as I did that uh, over a period of time, uh, I found myself moving from a state of, of being very down, uh, feeling like life was a burden, and I felt the burden being lifted. Um, I, I felt my steps getting lighter. I felt my joy returning. Um, and I felt a peace that I hadn't felt in a long time. I believe if I had said no to God when he was drawing me into Christian counseling, um, I would have survived the circumstances that I was in, um, but I would have missed tremendous growth, um, emotional growth and spiritual growth. And, uh, and here I am now, and, and uh, my walk is closer than it's ever been. And, and I, I would have missed that relationship with Christ, that intimacy with Christ, if, if I hadn't taken that step into Christian counseling. And you are, man, you are a masterpiece. <laughs> you are, brother. I mean, gosh, uh, not any, any more or less special, but I just uh, am blessed to know you. Oh, guys, I'm blessed to, to share. You know, I just, um, I told Kevin, I, I just said, um, one of the ways that God has blessed me and is continuing to bless me is by, by putting people in my path that I can encourage through my own struggles. I, I truly, uh, I truly get energy from that, right? And that's why when he asked me to do the video, I was, you know, a little bit daunted by it, but I was like, wow, I mean, if God can really use this to encourage just one person to come to Christian counseling, go to Christian counseling and uh, consider something they'd never considered before, man, how blessed would that be? I have seen uh, the last two years this growing wave of folks at the harbor who have said, I, I want to get emotionally healthy and strong. And uh, they have leaned in to meet with a Christian counselor. And uh, person after person has found a much deeper uh, emotional health because of that. And it's because for most of us, there's some messaging that's so deeply buried. We, we don't even uh, have a ways to access it with our mind. We don't have words for it, but they're impacting us. And so we have found across the, this part of the Houston area, we found the best counselors that are out there. And if you find yourself thinking there's probably something for me to, to gain from that, uh, just contact us. And we can help connect you to some of the best counselors you could imagine. What perceived truth is behind these emotions? That's the second key question to ask. And, and to be able to get to the bottom of that is crucial as well. Many times counseling is part of that process. The third question to ask uh, is, is it the whole truth? So I'm responding, my emotions are responding to perceived truth. Is it the whole truth? And this is what I've found that has helped me more than anything in the world. For many years, I studied the Bible, and I really was asking two questions. I was asking, what do you want me to know, God? Like, what is the truth? What do you want me to know? And what do you want me to do? Like, give me a bunch of head knowledge. Send me off on a mission. I'll do it. But somewhere along the way, I, was, I began to recognize, maybe the Spirit's prompting, I wasn't letting God actually change my emotional life until I inserted a middle question. What do you want me to know? What do you want me to feel based upon that truth? And what do you want me to do? And it began to change everything, everything. Years back, uh, what, two or three years back, uh, I had uh, a medical event with my eye. I thought I could lose sight there. I lost part of it, but I thought I was, could lose the entire sight. It was a shock to me, and, and I remember feeling such anxiety and fear. It may sound strange, but it was very, very real for me with the, the idea I could live with one eye going forward. And God had given me this passage. He put it in front of me a couple years before, even bought a couple of journals that have this on the journal. 
It's Isaiah 41.10. It says, don't be afraid for I'm with you. Don't be discouraged for I'm your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. I've been reading that every day. I open the journal. It's right there. And all of a sudden now I'm experiencing deep fear, deep anxiety. I pull it out and I read it and nothing happens. And I realized I had this head knowledge that said, don't be afraid, I'm your God. Don't be discouraged, I'm with you. The whole nine yards of it, I had the head knowledge, but it never sunk in so deeply, it moved my emotions. And so day after day after, I just lived in that. Okay, God, you said, like, don't be afraid, I'm your God. You're saying, I am your God. Don't be discouraged, for I am with you. I will strengthen you and help you. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And finally, after some days that, it began to sink into my emotions as well. Like, this is the God of the universe saying, you're going to be okay. If you live with one eye, I will be your God. I will be with you. I will say, you are going to be okay. And it changed my emotional life in that time. Simply because I let scripture speak into not only my informational brain, into the feelings of my heart as well and move the needle. Philippians 4.19 is a passage I hand out like it's candy. <laughs> it says, Paul writes, the same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. He's saying, I will su supply all of your needs. Now, Marie reminds me, he doesn't say all your wants, but all of your needs. And there was a time Marie and I back between engineering and pastoring, there was a time that we lost our most valuable possession. We had, we had very little left financially, and, and our family was, was in deep distress about that. And somehow this truth had soaked in so deep in us, it never faced us at all. I, I wish I could say that about all of Scripture, but this one for somebody had sunk in so deep. Maybe for you, this is one you need to hear. This is just an illustration of what's in Scripture. And every single section I've turned to, God has found something to move my emotional needle in the right direction. Nehemiah 11, and this is a barn burn. You have to open up and read Nehemiah 11. You know what it is? It's name after name after name after name. After name, after name. It's just a whole bunch of names. And so I was reading this and, get, okay, I get it, God. Can I skip to the end of the chapter? And I'm sensing God say, read it, read it, read it. So I kept on reading. And I finally said, what am I supposed to feel about this? Yawn. Because I said, God, I don't give a rip about these people. I don't care about these names. And I felt him say, but I do. I, I know each one intimately. I know their names. I put their names down in eternity. And I felt him say, so do you know how I feel about you? I know you. I know your name. You're my son's follower. You'll be with me through all of eternity. It, it changed my emotional world. If you want to try to live this out where you can ask the question, am I, am I responding to the whole truth? The best way I know to direct you is to scripture and ask three questions, not two. Ask, what do you want me to, to know? What do you want me to feel? What do you want me to do? So in your emotional world, I would say to you, as I say to myself, like what life would you and I be waiting for to, to grow health in that area? Like what life would we be waiting for? To, to try to grow into a place where we could be emotionally optimistic in the deepest way, in the deepest, where we can feel to the very core the hard things. I have had some of the deepest human anguish I could imagine, and I have felt it to the core, at the same time feeling the presence of God to walk me through that as well. What life would you and I be waiting for? A couple of closing thoughts around this for you. One is this, is to understand that some depression and some anxiety can, be, can have nothing to do with spiritual life at all. It can be driven by chemical imbalance. And so if you're uh, battling with depression or anxiety and none of this seems to move that, then thank God we live in the time now where there are medications that can help, can correct that, that chemical balance. There are doctors and psychiatrists with expertise in this area. So just know that. If you're struggling and you're living all this out, you're still struggling, then look at that option, that possibility as well. Second thing is this. I've just touched the tip of the iceberg on this. And there's, there's an exceptional book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality 
by Peter Scazzaro. I would highly recommend this book. We have a few copies in the back. Highly recommend it to you in deep insights. Very, very readable. Very, very impactful to one's life. And then there's a second book that kind of takes that and lets you, helps you live it out day by day. It's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Day by Day by Scazzaro as well. A few copies of that in the back as well. To be emotionally optimistic, what life are you and I waiting for? Father in heaven, Thank you that you uh, care so deeply about all of us, including our hearts and our emotions. Thank you for giving us the way, uh, the means and the way to live with healthy emotions, where we, we tend to them, where we, we ask, we, we probe what we're feeling. We get behind that to see what perceived truth is creating that emotion. We get even deeper than that, and we ask, is, is this, am I responding to the whole truth, Father? Help us learn to walk in that, to be impacted, to be stirred, to be shaped by that, Father. And then, Father, um, we're about to sing the song, uh, King of My Heart. And what a great choice that Chris has made because uh, I long, we long for you to be king of our hearts, king over our emotions, Father. So as we sing and worship, we sing this to you in Jesus' name, amen.